Today on Applied Science, I'd like to show you some x-ray video, but not just any x-ray video, high-speed x-ray video captured with this photon counting camera that can do about 300 frames a second. So let me show you some of the footage that I acquired, and then we'll talk about how the camera works. Finding subjects for this setup is actually pretty tricky because the thing needs to pass enough x-rays to make a good image. So anything with a metal plate like a pocket watch isn't going to work. Uh, the best subjects are made of water or plastic and al allow enough x-rays to get through to make an image. I was especially excited about these. These are Mexican jumping beans, something from my childhood. And you always wonder what's inside there. I mean, you know it's an insect larva, but exactly what's going on. Um, they do jump quite well. These are the most active jumping beans that I've ever seen. I'll put a link in the description. Uh, keep track of this guy on the left. Yeah, he gets some real air time. Uh, also making good use of the high speed, uh, things that are dynamic, you know, fluids that move around or things that bounce or jump are interesting subjects for high speed video. In this case, I turned the frame rate back down to about 60 frames a second because getting, again, getting enough x-rays even through this plain old switch was a problem. I think I cranked the frame rate back up to about two or three hundred for this one. This one is small enough where you can get a good image, and you can see it's a little bit noisier that the um, household light switch was less noisy because the frame rate was lower. But here you can actually see the mechanism inside there and see my finger bones too. Now this is interesting. This is actually a knockoff micro switch, uh, not a name brand. And when you see, when you look in there, it's actually just pushing sideways on that coil spring, which is probably not a great design for longevity. In contrast, this is a commercial name brand micro switch rated for a high number of cycles. And you can see internally it's built completely differently. There's no coil spring, it's a leaf spring. And it's even like double articulated. So it's, it has a very uh, controlled movement inside there. I also got the feeling that, you know, living creatures would be an interesting thing to, sub, uh, to test. And insects are a great uh, place to start because they're kind of everywhere and small. And uh, this insect in particular, a sow bug, has a shell which is, has a different radio transparency than the rest of it. And so you get a really good high resolution image of them. And then I thought, you know, really the best thing would be to get a cricket jumping. Like, that would be the best use of this high-speed x-ray setup. And so I, I got some crickets from the store and spent many days trying to get them to jump on command and never got it to happen, actually. Surprisingly, they were jumping in the car, but not jumping here. But I was still thinking of jumping, and so why not plastic? And so they have these little, you know, plastic poppers, another toy from the childhood. You know, at least I got that on camera, jumping. And then finally, I was looking for some... Um, fluid dynamics that would be interesting. And so what we're doing here is dripping uh, potassium iodide solution into water. And not surprisingly, it looks a lot like dripping food coloring in, but it's pretty cool to think that the contrast there is coming from additional x-ray absorption just from that potassium iodide dissolved in the, in the stuff that I'm dripping in. There's another good wind-up toy. It's kind of jumping around so you see the dynamics there. And in this case, you know, what was weird that stood out to me on this one is that there's some kind of contamination under the toy's fur. Like, you see all those black spots there. There's some kind of high molecular weight or metal or something that's mixed in with the toy's fur or under the fur or something. I'm going to have to get the XRF gun out and find out what this thing is contaminated with. <laughs> it's kind of funny. And then, you know, any insect that happened to fly through the shop I caught and, you know, wanted to see how it was going to look in the thing. One interesting thing is that they all have this air sac inside them, these insects. This is the last insect, um, a butterfly that I found in the garden. And uh, the detail that you can see on this is pretty cool. You can see the coiled up mouth part there, and you can even see the butterfly's wings with pretty good detail. It's impressive that you know, something as thin as an, a butterfly wing catches enough x-rays to be visible there. In order to capture these high-speed x-ray videos, the sensor has to be extremely sensitive, capturing as much uh, x-ray energy as it possibly can and turning it into an image. And it does this by photon counting, which is a fundamentally different way of operating than a standard camera sensor. So in a previous video, I had a large area x-ray detector, and it works basically by, you know, it's very similar to a large format uh, sensor that you would find in a normal digital camera, and internally it has a phosphor screen bonded to the sensor and the whole thing is in the dark.
So when an x-ray comes in, it causes the phosphor screen to produce a little flash of light. The light goes into the camera, and the way that those camera sensors work is it's basically like a little bucket of uh, storage, of energy storage. So an incoming photon knocks an electron into the bucket. And then at the end of the exposure period, you basically measure how many electrons you have in the bucket using an analog digital converter. And this is fine, but there's definitely uh, losses throughout this process. So for example, an incoming x-ray might cause a flash of light from the phosphor screen, but then that phosphor uh, you know, ejected photon, the visible photon, goes in the wrong direction and doesn't go into the image sensor. Or you start filling up your bucket and there's noise in your analog digital converter and you know, there's all these processes. So at the end of the day, an exposure with that old setup was about five seconds. Now, fair enough, I had the tube much further away than I do with the setup here, but still, a five second exposure would imply a 0.2 frame per second frame rate. And this is able to capture video at 300 frames per second. So we're talking about a thousand times more exposure and or sensitivity to make up a good image. So the way this works is it's, it's a direct conversion sensor. So when an X-ray photon goes in, there's a semiconductor that's specially tuned to catch X-ray photons between five and 30 kilo electron volts. And when the photon goes in, there's a chance that it is instantly converted into a digital pulse. So it just counts photons. And it's cool, the output of this is a 32-bit TIFF image, and that number is how many photons hit the pixel during your exposure. And you can choose to have an exposure from like a microsecond up to a million seconds, and it just sits there and counts, just counts photons. Um, I think the rated dynamic range of this device is 20 bits, or about a, a million to one, which is very high, extremely high dynamic range. As you might have guessed, this specialized piece of equipment is extremely expensive, and we can thank the good folks at Dectris for loaning this to me because there's no way I'd be able to afford it. But it gets even better. Dectris is pushing the state of the art, and their latest detectors have a field of view that is substantially larger and can capture 8 megapixels at several thousand frames per second. And so maybe if we all ask nicely and uh, the sales rep schedule aligns with mine, we can capture some video with that. Um, when I asked about their latest highest performance detectors, uh, the rep said, well, um, those, are, uh, those are substantial. And for some reason, I got this image in my mind that they send the sales rep out with it in a briefcase, kind of handcuffed to his uh, you know, wrist or something. But they are very, very specialized, very expensive pieces of equipment. The care and feeding of this detector are also pretty unusual. When I'm not using it, I keep it in a bag with this big desiccant uh, pack because it's moisture sensitive. And when the um, sensor is in use, it has a port for dry nitrogen or argon, which you plug in there, and it just blows about half a liter a minute of dry gas through there because it is sensitive to moisture. And the front of it is this mirror-looking thing. It's actually a very thin piece of mylar that I have a feeling if you touch it, that might destroy the camera. So it has, they're very, very sensitive and specialized. And so you might be wondering, what do you actually do with these things? I get the feeling that most of the clients are actually not interested in capturing high-speed x-ray video, like shadowgrams, like I was showing in this video. Uh, these are typically used at beamlines, at uh, particle accelerator installations, where you might want to look at XRF. So you're going to shoot your particle beam at something and you want to capture the x-rays that are scattered off of that interaction. So these are typically set up in a way that the beam doesn't shoot right into the detector, it's just looking at the stuff that's scattered from what you're aiming at. Uh, places like ETER and other like giant accelerator, you know, particle physics um, institutions would be interested in this detector. I get the feeling that imaging is actually a fairly unusual use for this, believe it or not. The system also includes this rack mount server, which is running a customized version of Linux optimized for high-speed real-time data transfer. And the physical link between the computer and the detector is this PCI card uh, called a Gigastar, which I'd never heard of before. Uh, but remember that these images are uncompressed for a lot of the scientific uses that you'd want to use this system for. Uh, compressing the image would ruin all that. So it's sending a 32-bit per pixel image at these high frame rates into the computer and storing them as uncompressed 32-bit TIFFs so that the data rates can be very high. A typical acquisition works like this. With, with everything set up in place, I'll turn the x-ray tube on and then run the acquisition command, which will start pulling data in from the sensor. And after the acquisition is complete, you're basically left with 
hundreds or thousands of these 32-bit TIFF files. And as it turns out, viewing those TIFF files in a video format is quite difficult. So when you're recording these things, you got to have sort of a way of determining if you got a good take or not. So setting something up, a bouncing ball or a jumping cricket or whatever it is, you got to, you know, you have no way of knowing if you've got the actual action or not when the acquisition is over. So um, <laughs> opening a 32-bit TIFF is challenging enough. This version of Linux comes with a program called Image Magic, which doesn't even open 32-bit TIFFs. Uh, you have to recompile it, and I didn't want to do all that. So I found out the best thing to do is to use Image J, which can open 32-bit TIFFs, and even batch save them as 16-bit TIFFs that I can then import into uh, my nonlinear editing software, Resolve. And that actually worked out fine. So the whole pipeline actually ended up being okay. Just figuring it out uh, was, was a little bit of a challenge. Quick note on x-ray safety. Uh, just like in my last x-ray video, I described uh, the precautions that I'm taking. So the x-ray tube that I'm using is a 50 kilovolt, one milliamp tube, which is very comparable to what you would encounter in a dentist's office. So the same safety protocols that you as a patient and the dentist would take apply here as well. Uh, the main thing is to stop the main beam. So I have this steel setup in back of where I'm shooting the x-rays so that the primary beam is always intercepted by the heavy steel. And I've used a Geiger counter to verify that there's not any primary beam that gets through there. Now there's still backscatter, of course. The uh, Geiger counter is beeping even though it's not in front of the x-ray tube due to backscatter. And so I've also walked around the entire garage with the Geiger counter to verify that um, the backscatter doesn't get out through the walls. So when I'm using this, the entire shop is the enclosure for this x-ray system. Another random question, why does a Mexican jumping bean jump? It sounds a lot like why did the chicken cross the road, but no, this is actually a real answer. Uh, it's trying to get out of the sunlight. And I'll show you, I didn't realize how light sensitive these things are, but you can hear the, just listen for the clicking. And then when I turn the lights out, completely quiet. And when you flip the lights back on, they're back to jumping around again. So when they're really active like this, they're trying to jump out of the sunlight to get in the shade so that they don't overheat. And as the day goes on, you know, the sunlight might change where it's shining on the ground. So they start jumping around to kind of follow the shadows and stay in the cool. So I have a feeling that high-speed x-ray video will show up again on my channel, maybe with the super high-end detector or this one again. Um, finding subjects that are good to, to video with the small field of view and at this frame rate is pretty challenging. And I know some of you are thinking, why didn't I just get a mouse or something? Remember that this is YouTube, and if I do that, I'm probably going to want to work with a real kinesiology researcher to, to make actual research, you know, good use of the, of the video in that case, which I think it would be. I think super high-speed video of a mouse moving would be pretty, pretty useful and pretty cool to watch. Well, anyway, I hope you found that interesting. See you next time. Bye.